the last one, we got some kennels or a do- uh, somewhere that you look after dogs. Or something um, like that. My partner runs a dog daycare centre. Right, um, is that still running? It's not, no. No, at the minute that's closed down because uh, basically everyone's at home so they don't need their dogs oh, looking after. And obviously you, it, it works by going into people's properties when they're at work, getting their dog, um, taking it out uh, to our purpose-built park um, yeah. and looking after it for the day. So, uh, yeah, that'd be a no-no at the minute. Right, yeah, definitely. <laughs> right. So, so we're yeah. not on here to talk about work. We're here to talk about fishing and something pretty um, specialised that I wanted to talk to you about. Yes. Because, obviously, when we get out fishing again, hopefully, the weather's going to be warm. We're going to yes. be catching plenty of fish. Your particular style of fishing that fries my brain on well stock <laughs> lakes is just something totally different. So talk us through paste shallow. I want to know Wait, firstly. Have you ever tried it? I've tried it a couple of times and I've caught fish doing it, but I yes. yeah, obviously I never feel like obviously you're well up to speed with it, you know what you're doing with it. I never yeah. feel like I'm doing it to your to what your level would be at all. So I know that it works. I know that it's got some legs in it, definitely. But it definitely I need, has, yeah. So I need to know rigs. I need to know how you feed it. I need to know the bait you use. I need to know it from start to finish how you go about it. Where should we start then? You, Let's I start. Suppose, we're going to start with at rigs. Start with rigs. Start with yes. everything to do with the rig. Then we'll talk about feeding and then we'll talk about the bait itself because that's quite important, obviously. Okay. Um, so I've got a nice top kit ready to go. This is a rig that I've actually used in anger. Um, still got a little bit of ground bait on it, so it's uh, it's definitely been used. This one. So um, obviously with paste, you're going to need a fairly specialised float. Um, I had these made probably seven or eight years ago, I suppose, by Gaz Malman, and I've never seen the need to change ever since. Um, you've got a two mil hollow bristle a wire stem and what Gaz did for me was um, he over lengthened them slightly um, which would would sink the float down so then I could trim them back. So um, self cocking that float? Self cocking yeah there's no shot okay. on the line at all. Yep. Um, yeah so that wire always allow, allowed me to fine tune um, the float basically. Uh, these have been super strong um, you'll be pleased to know Gaz that I've never broken one or lost one uh, so all the original ones that he made I'm still using now. Um, and I've still got probably 10 or 15 spare ready to go in the garage if I ever, use, if I ever do lose some. But I can't see that happening, to be honest. I think they're going to last, last me out to retirement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's the idea. But you've got a small float there. It's obviously very small in, um, in, in terms of depths because you're always fish, fishing up in the water. So you don't want it to be too obtrusive. You know, when we talk about depths, we're talking about usually F1s and smaller carp, aren't we? So uh, this is this is predominantly um, F ones. You do occasionally catch a carp on it, but uh, due to the way they feed, um, it's not really a carp method. If it was predominantly carp, I wouldn't fish um, pay shallow for it. So this we're talking sort of like the top eighteen inches or even the top foot of water. Um, the killing zone has always been a foot exactly. Okay. Uh, so when I set up, I'll, I'll set up two or three rigs um, and they'll be at four inch sort of increments from one foot going upwards. Um, fishing shallower than that has never been sort of that right, if you know what I mean. Yeah. A, it, a foot has always been um, as shallow as you need to go to catch efficiently. If, they, if they're feeding shallower than that, uh, you struggle. And I'll go into that in a bit of what you do to control that once you start talking about feeding and fishing. But yeah, getting back to the float, um, the idea is you don't you don't want to be dotting this rig down to like a pimple. Um, here we go, I'll do it the other way around. Uh, you can't really see the bites properly. The key is to have um, probably, I'd say, what's that, half an inch of float showing? Yeah. Um, a nice decent amount of float showing because you don't want to be striking at the little tiny dips, which you would do if it was dotted down. Because um, obviously every time you strike with this, Rob, you, you have to come back in and start again. Yeah, so sure. By dotting it down, you're going to lose that efficiency because you just want to be striking at bites and hooking the fish. Uh, every, time you, every time you miss a bite, it's wasted time um, and you lose your efficiency. So, it's so that's one of the hardest things to get right every single chuck is to have uh, the right amount of float showing with the right side. Because you're making the ball of paste out of your hand um, every time you go out. It's not so it's creating that uniform out. size of paste, isn't it? 
Right. Yeah, you just end up getting into the mode of doing it, um, and it feels like the same same sort of way. But yeah, that's one of the key bits for efficiency is getting making sure you're making the same size bit every single time and having a good amount of float showing. So yeah, that's the float. Um, right. Line wise, are we talking heavy lines or because we're F1 absolutely. fishing? You're right. Okay. Yeah. So O20 uh, main line, and that's basically to try and keep it as stiff as possible and anti-tangle proof. And obviously, you're catching big weights when you're fishing in this style, so you want a, a, a proper heavy, robust main line. And um, your hook clamps, it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, there's no point fishing O10 because it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. So you can fish O16, O18 hook clamps with your O20 main line. Okay. And what hook? And what hook are we using? Line. Obviously, a big hook, is it? A uh, 14 or a 16 sort of KM4 sort of style that I'd use. I don't want something of a, a decent thickness because obviously your hook's masked by a, a, a piece of paste. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. The fish can't see it. Um, you don't want it too thick because uh, I think you can potentially lead to the hook not setting properly. But you want something that the paste is going to grip onto. Right. And elastic-wise, what are we talking? Uh, see, I've... I've I've gone all around the houses when it comes to elastic. So uh, when I first started doing this years ago, I fished heavy elastic just because I wanted to land the fish as quickly as possible. And then I got obsessed with using really soft elastic. Um, say like uh, the yellow holocore, the midi yellow holocore I used to use a lot. Yeah. Uh, coupled with a short kit. Um, and the idea of that was to try and get him to leave the peg a lot smoother and, and increase the catch sort of period, if you know what I mean, by making less disturbance. But as time's gone on, um, I've gone back to fishing like a heavy elastic. Because um, as we'll get onto in a bit, this sort of method, um, you're basically catching real short bursts uh, rather than consistently catch. Okay, so, so you've, got to make the most, you've got to make the most of them when they're in your peg. Which you can do with a soft elastic, don't get me wrong, but um, as you'll probably know, it, it, with a soft elastic, I always find you end up putting more pressure on a fish than um, what you do a heavy elastic. Yeah, you end up getting in a bit of a ra yeah. ravel at, the, at your net, don't you? You end up pulling loads out on your puller kit and you end up losing the odd fish because you put too much pressure yeah, on Yeah, it. I just think you actually lose less fish um, when you're trying to catch quickly with a, with a, with a stronger elastic yeah. just because you're actually putting less pressure on them. If that makes What's sense. that then? A, a yellow reactor core? That's a yellow reactor core. Yeah, for beautiful. That's, that's what I use for carping and sort of like really quite aggressive F1 work as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can, this, you can proper put a weight together on this for a short kit. Like, yeah. you don't really need, even need to pull out any out the other end. You just uh, lift up and they're in the net. But yeah. it's definitely a short top kit um, method. So, yeah, that, that's the rigs. Um, when it comes to... Hang on, Lee, Lee, Lee. Yeah. Hang on. Why have you got two pots there? Talk to me about that. That's what I'm about to go on to. Go on, then. So the reason pace shallow works so well is uh, basically it allows you to very accurately put in um, some ground bait, which as we all know, it's hugely attractive to F1s. You can put a tiny amount in very accurately around your float. But with pace, you're also, you're also put in something that's very soft on the hook that you can't um, ship out. So what you don't want to be doing is having a piece of paste in with the same pot because it'll all stick together because you've got like quite a wet sloppy mix that you'll put in this front one and if you yeah. put your hook bait in there it's all going to come out in one you want it separate for the fish to home in on okay. quicker, so if that makes in that sense. front pot then that's for your feed that's my feed and now will that be slightly cloudier and slightly damper than your oh yes yeah that's uh, that's that's quite sort of wet it's not liquid um but it's a very wet mix and you just sort of like, you keep your ground bait in a bowl and slowly add water to it all the time and always keep an area that's at the right consistency. Uh, if, you, if you remember back to the old bleak days when we used to be on the knee, where we so used you, to chuck that. And it needs, that to splat, it needs to splat on the water and... Splat on the water and make a cloud. Yeah, yeah it's okay. like that consistency. I've forgotten what that's called now. Is that a bletz? Um, no, there was a sense of surface. Yeah. And then a bletz is the... French for bleak, so yeah, probably a bleak ground bait, and then used to, and we still do, add loads of trussets to it, the colour. That's the one, yeah. yeah. That's the sort of consistency you'd be putting that in, something that you can throw, because when you're not fishing this on the venues that allow, you will throw onto yeah, sure. your line. Um, but yeah, that's what goes into that front part. The sort of consistency that. where you have to roll it in your palm to make a ball, rather than squeeze it. No, you literally, it's, 
it's it's very very wet. It's hard, it, it, it's only just um, only just holds together. Oh, to so you wouldn't it. even be able to roll it then. You'd have to it, 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 you you sort of getting a bit on your finger to flick it almost. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like it's that sort of consistency where it's it's touch or go wherever it gets there. Right. All right. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> a messy method. Uh, and, then, and then you put the uh, the paste in the back pot if okay. you like. So as you're going out, you've always in that you've always got that triangle shape, which perfect. is why so no, there's no tangles. Yeah, you don't want tangles. You just want to, you know, have a nice, efficient rig that's not going to tangle. So you're, I've always found that's easier to do with a bit of line between your pole tip and the float. I'll show you that. Yeah. So that's probably approaching a the foot there. Um, yeah. And I always found that a lot easier to do than trying to fish dead tight like that. You, yeah, of course. So that's what you're aiming to do, is to have a pot set a bit further back, your little feeding pot at the front. That's that sort of... Um, Grip flex, a small grip flex size is about perfect. You don't want to be feeding a lot of bait here. So like a bag of ground bait will last you all, all match, basically. Is that because obviously you end up pushing the fish down or they just don't, they just don't just like don't it? it. Just and the, more, the more you put in, the more um, options you give them. Um, and it, like, as you know yourself, ground bait's that attractive. You don't actually need to feed a lot no. to attract fish. It releases all of its stimulants and so it's got such a big surface area that you put it in and it attracts the fish. You don't need a huge amount of bait with this at all. I remember when people first started fishing pace shallow, it was always like kilos and kilos of bait. And that's, that's all wrong to me. Right. So yeah, just a small, small pot of the front, bigger pot of the back, and obviously that sits further back the tip to create that triangle shape so you're not tangling. Perfect. Um, so what next? Right, talk to me about the baits you use, because obviously we've talked about have the consistency of the bait, but I want to know about the, the bait, the actual paste that you're going to use. Is okay, it a ground so bait? Is it a dedicated paste? It's a dedicated paste. So the feed has always been a crushed pellet or a pellet based ground bait, which okay. can either be, I've used crushed expander over the years or ground up pellets. And um, it's basically a pellet based mix that you want to use um, wetted heavily um, to make that cloud and track the fish into your do you, do you ever add anything to it like a trussix or something like that to make extra um, i've always been confident with a green mix so um i don't know whether it's because that green because you're fishing up in the water and uh, it's almost like a silhouette you you, you create against the uh, the sky but right. um a green mix has always been something that i've used to do it and it seems to work and it's what green's just br green's a brilliant color anyway isn't it for all for everything yeah, yeah. Just a but yeah, it's, uh, if uh, if I've not got a green ground bait, I'll put a green dye with it, basically. Okay, right, okay. Um, now, the paste itself is a bit more specialised. It's something that you have to, uh, I've always made myself at home um, with a coffee grinder because it needs to be dead fine, it, as fine as you can get it. Right. Um, and it needs to have quite a high oil content. Right, now we're getting to the nitty gritty, aren't we? This is yes. what we want to find out. Yeah, go on, carry on. Uh, so yeah, you're looking at a high oil pellet, ground as fine as possible through a coffee grinder. And again, I'll put a bit of green dye with it to match the ground bait so, it, so it's not a different colour, if you like. But the oil content allows you to mix it a bit wetter and it will stay on the hook for a bit longer. You don't, so it's not super soft, um, the paste that you um, put on the hook. So I'd imagine if you was to hold it up unsupported, it would just hold on. Okay. But only just. And what we're doing is the size of a, a big pea sort of thing, or? Um, I would say, so you've only got to look at, a, at the size of an F1's mouth to know what sort of size bit of paste you're putting on. And it's not as big as people think, because the, the, the mouths aren't that big, are they? No, no. So I think, uh, personally, what's always worked well for me is about the size of a thumbnail. Okay. So that sort of size. Yeah. Uh, and I, that's worked for me fishing on the bottom when I do my. Uh, little bits of pea paste short and uh, when you're up in the water but obviously it's the same paste that I use for both but when you're up in the water it, you, you're wetting it off a lot more because you're, mm. you're looking to get a bite in sort of 10 20 seconds uh, maximum when you're fishing like this so, so you're in and out you're filling both pots every time you ship in every time you ship in you go in and when, when, when you drop that in what happens is obviously you can see that that feed pot's pretty much above the flow so yeah. you'll drop in um, turn the pot upside down, you'll then tap that against the water to make a bit of noise and release that cloud. And at the same time, um, your hook paste will fall out of the pot and it will settle. 
um, slap bang over the top of all of itself, basically. And then all you have to do is pull your pole tip back and then you sit in with your pole tip directly above the float, ready, ready for that bite, and then you go, you're in. Oh, and you're lasting us. It's dead accurate. It's really accurate. You've got a, a really um, attractive bait that you don't need to feed a lot of. And obviously, um, I've always fished paste um, purely for, for one reason and one reason only. is the fact that when you've got a big, heavy bait, when, and it doesn't matter if you're on the bottom or up in the water, a fish cannot touch that in any way, shape or form without getting an indication. So yeah. you'll either get a lift bite, which is very rare because you want to be yeah. fishing above the fish, or you get a proper um, unmissable bite, basically. Right. Are you feeding uh, any pellets or anything like that with it, with it, or just relying on purely on in and out with that sloppy ground bait? Relying on the ground bait, yeah, yeah. Okay, superb. So uh, it's a busy. Yeah, that, 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 that's why I fish paste. It's uh, they cannot. Uh, un unlike any other bait, which um, I'll come on to in a bit when I do the comparison to like maggot and caster fishing, they cannot touch that hook bait without giving you a proper indication. But everything okay. else they can feed on with and. They can get away with it, basically. Okay, give me a comparison with this maggot and caster fish in there. So, um, up until sort of, I'd say three or four years ago, I would say that um, this pace shallow, when it worked for me, its inefficiencies didn't matter. Um, if, I, if I had bites, um, I'd basically win the match because um, the weight that I would catch would far suit, uh, was, was far bigger than what you'd catch on other methods. Okay, was that size of fish that you were catching or just... Nothing to do with that at all. I just think um, on, let, let's say when you're fishing maggots and casters, for example. Um, now, I do think people have got a lot more efficient at catching fish on these methods in the last three or four years with self-hooking rigs, etc., etc. But you, you start putting it into layman's terms. Um, a lot of people will feed twice, yeah, when they go out with maggots. Yeah. So put it in your mind you've got 15 or 20 maggots in each one of those feeds so you've got one hook bait on that you've slapped in and you've put 15 or 20 maggots in twice all of a sudden you've got 40 bits of bait in your in, in your swim which fish are feeding on and they're getting away with it because you don't get a bite every single time you lay that rig do you no um so basically what what i'm saying to you is like you can keep feeding lots and lots and lots of bait with maggots and casters and the fish in your peg can feed on them and get away with it. Now, obviously, you know yourself in the last three or four years, um, we've, we've all got a lot better at catching on these baits with um, short, hook, short line above your floats, um, overshotted rigs. Yeah, no, no, uh, yeah, no, no floats. Jiggers, yeah. No floats, jiggers. And that, that's because all, the fish in your peg are that good or that, that skilled at feeding on your bait and getting away with it um that we've had to adapt the way we fish so uh, a few years ago like i said if i had, if i knew if i if i got bites on pace shallow um i'd potentially win the match because i was looking to catch 150 200 pounds yeah. that's the sort of weights that i would get which used to be enough but yeah. in the last sort of few years i would say that the ceiling weight on this hasn't got any bigger uh, because like i said to you earlier um you're catching short short bursts uh, whereas on maggots and casters, because of that inefficiency and you, the amount of bait that you can put into your peg where fish can carry on feeding, not getting caught, um, that ends up making your peg last longer. Whereas the reality with this is I feed one bit of ground bait, one bit of paste, put it in and I get a bite and I hook it every okay. single time when it's right. So you, you, in you put it into direct comparison. I've put two bits of bait in versus, say, forty maggots, and I've had I, I've had a bite straight away. Whereas you wouldn't necessarily do it with a maggot. If that makes no. sense. Yeah, I understand. So you're saying it's when the fish are there, it's super efficient. You catch the there's, fish. There's absolute. Even to this day, there's nothing quicker than this to catch F ones. Right. Uh, the only problem you've got is because of that super efficiency, uh, you're catching bursts because the fish know if they feed in that area, they're going to get caught. Yeah, so you absolutely, you, you clatter them rather than steadily catching them. Absolutely clatter them, yeah. I used yeah. to, uh, the most I've caught in the first hour, I think was at um, Trio Lakes a few years ago. And I think I had 60 or 70 F1s in this, on this in the first hour. Right. right. Um, but then, like I said, what happens is the fish start feeding with caution uh, because you're catching them, you're clattering them. Yeah. And like, every time they come in the peg, one of them gets caught because... Yeah. It, just can't, it just can't ha carry on like that for five hours, can it? It just can't. So basically, um, 
the problem with this uh, this method, which I've I've learned in the last few years, is its efficiency is its biggest weakness. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. You almost need a super venue for it to work. You need a venue that's um, going to. I don't know. I think uh, I think I've been looking at it in the wrong way. So I've sort of shied off using it so much in the last couple of years. But um, it's got me thinking um, that basically I probably I could probably combine the efficiency of this early on in a match um, and then swap it over to fishing overshotted rigs. Or okay. When or when it gets a little bit tougher later on, you can refine yeah, it. Yeah. 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 Because um, yeah, like I said. Even to this day, I don't think there's anything more efficient than this. Like when, right. when, it, when this works, you go in, you pat it, and you've hooked one within five seconds, every single chuck. And because you've got robust gear on, heavy elastics, you just pile a weight together so quickly. Right, brilliant. Before you get um, back to doing some book work or whatever you've got to do tonight, yep. can you tell me two things? Your biggest weight that you caught pace shallow. Okay. Uh, I think it's 299. Right. A bit, a bit frustrating. <laughs> it sounds a little <laughs> bit frustrating. <laughs> so what, and that's all F1s, is it? Yeah. Okay. It's all F1s. What, venue, what venue was that? That was Partridge. Right. Um, and it was on an evening match, to be fair. Once a year, a few of us, um, we, we, hired, we get the Cobies for one of the lads' birthday in August. And yeah. uh, we just go and empty it one evening. Right. Partridge is ridiculous on an yeah. evening. Yeah. So uh, I learned uh, when I was doing this a lot that you had to control the fish in your peg a lot more than what you'd do um, fishing other methods. Because for some reason, I don't know why, but um, if you try to start fishing shallower than a foot, you miss a lot more bites. Um, so what you used to have to do is because the fish, it's such a tight area you feed on, um, the fish would get used to where it's coming in and sit above your rigging effect. Okay. So I used to have to do what I used to call shifting the shoal, which is basically like, you know where the shoulder fish is, you drop in, you miss a bite because there's so many there. Um, so I just used to be moving around all the time because the closer you come to you, obviously the, um, the less confident fish are and the less fish that are coming to your peg. So if you're having that, that, that run in your match where you're missing bites because they're too high, literally all you do is take a meter off your pole and instantly um, you'd feed a meter closer to you and you'd start catching again because they're not as sitting high, as high up in the water as what they were. And then conversely, obviously, if you start going in and not getting bites, you stuck a meter back on. You're just constantly moving back and forwards. Um, so you felt they left. dropped down the closer that you, you fished Correct. towards your fishing position. The fish just dropped down a little bit, almost become a little bit less confident. Yes, that used to be one of the biggest problems with this was... Uh, they were too confident. Too confident. Right, yes. and I guess they never ever see it, do they? They never ever see it, really. Because no. like you say, most guys go with pellets or maggots or casters and they fish in that sort of style. And they never yeah, like I said, I, I actually think that, that, efficient, that inefficiency, if you like, and I hate to call it that, but I, I, I watched them at Partridge uh, feeding before and um, um, it was one of these it, them evening matches, actually. It, it hit it home to me exactly why... Um, this works, and then self-hooking rigs, etc. cetera. Um, you're chucking pellets down the edge in the reeds, and every single carp that come in, uh, you could drop a pellet in, because they were sucking off the reeds, and you could, you'd hook it every single time. Um, an F1, on a tight line with a big shot that far from the hook, could suck that bait in, I never, and I've never caught one for the entire night, because they can suck a, a bait in on a tight line and reject it without hooking themselves. Right. And that, that's with particles. See, so um, you know, there's there's a few anglers out now now that are brilliant at this shallow fishing, and uh, a lot of it, lot, a lot of them are constantly striking, and uh, that works just because, um, in 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 my opinion, they're hooking them um, as the fishes suck that bait in. They're they're, they're actually hooking them by mistake. And just more of averages. By the, if they're going to jig it around, right. they're going to pull into a fish, right? Yes, and I, I'm 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 convinced watching them feed. Um, one, one night on there that that's why where we at with, with shallow fishing now is that the, the fish have been caught that often that they know how to feed on your hook bait and not get caught a lot of the time right wow okay right before you go three venues where pace shallow is going to work uh tunnel barn yeah of course uh, yeah. anywhere with f1 right. <laughs> so we're talking tunnel barn partridge tunnel barn partridge heronbrook um, Heronbrook, Heronbrook, I've won some matches at Heronbrook on that. Um, Lindome, I guess Lindome. 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 Uh, yes, but Lindome is very strange. Um, it, 
you're not allowed to tap the water on Lindo, but every so often on the qualifiers, he'll tell you on the morning you can. So right. it, it's, it's like pot luck of whether it's going to work. Cause you, you need to make that noise to make it work basically. Okay. Um, and and uh, just, just tipping the, um, the ground bait out of the pot doesn't quite make that noise that's right to it. Uh, to home the fish at them. So it's that sort of splat of the pole pot on the water as well that, that make, makes a big the difference. Fish that, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. But I guess mimicking... somewhere like Benny's Lake at Lindome, it, it'd be awesome. Oh, it'd be it? ridiculous, yeah. But again, it's, it all, all depends on what he does on the day with the rules. Like I said, some of the qualifiers I've been to, yeah. as you stood in the draw queue, I've left all my pace shallow gear at home. And he said, oh, you can do what you want today. Yeah, I guess on the, some of the bigger matches, it's a bit more difficult for him to police, isn't it? So he's yeah, maybe yeah. relaxed the rules a little bit. Uh, but Basically, anywhere with um, anywhere with load of F ones, and like I said, um, it's something that I've sort of stopped doing so much in the last couple of years. But it's definitely got something I'm going to start bringing back in, just because I think um, that initial burst it can give me um, could give me the edge in the matches. Yeah, of course. All right, thank you very much, Lee. Until next time. Okay. Stay safe. Get to work. Get yeah. your building done, and uh, hopefully <laughs> we'll be on the bank soon. You've had a haircut as well, haven't you? Yeah, I shaved it all off. I, yeah, it's not, it, as drastic, it's not as drastic as mine, but... Oh, it was drastic. This was is, it? Uh, but yours no, is growing back and mine isn't. Yours is growing back and mine isn't. <laughs> <laughs>